So in this video, we're going to be talking about consuls and tribunes and dictators, the magistrates of the Roman Republic. As I mentioned before, young nobles of the Roman Republic were all expected to prove themselves by passing up through the same ladder of offices, the cursus honorum. This meant, amongst other things, that the candidates for each office tended to be of similar age and similar experience, reinforcing the idea that the governance of Rome was being shared amongst the propertied families, each generation sharing the offices amongst themselves and rising up the ladder of offices together. A typical Roman youth of the property classes would start out performing his military service following his coming of age at 14. After fighting in a few campaigns, the first stage of a political career would be to run for military tribune, an elected junior officer position in the Roman army. There were six of these per legion, depending on the era, so this is a broadly available position and a usual entry point into Roman politics. The next rung was to serve as quaestor. There were 10 of these each year during the Middle and Late Republic, and their job was to manage the Republic's finances and investigate the use or misuse of public funds or lands. This is a good time to mention that the Roman Republic had no civil servants, no administrators, no bureaucracy at all, the government of Rome consisted solely of these elected officials that I'm talking about in this video, and they essentially did all of the major work of the government. The next elected office was the Ideal. There were four of these each year in the Middle and Late Republic, two patrician and two plebeian, and their job was to oversee the public games and festivals and to maintain public buildings. This was a critical role as the games and festivals were a primary means of interacting with and appeasing the Roman gods, and so forestalling military disaster, plague, and other misfortunes that the gods might visit on you if they were unhappy for whatever reason. Also, because the games were so visible and involved such spectacle, they were an ideal way for a young politician to make his name with the Roman public. After holding the ideal ship, you were eligible to run for praetor, the lowest office with imperium, the ability to compel a Roman citizen. There were six praetors in the Middle and Late Republic, and their primary task was to judge conflicts between citizens or criminal cases involving offenses against the community. They also dealt with suits by or offenses by foreign citizens against the Roman government. So their basic duty involved hearing cases. But as the consuls were often out of the city leading armies, the praetors were often in charge of governing the city on a day-to-day -day basis and could perform some executive actions in the consul's absence, such as, for example, convening the assembly or dedicating temples to the gods. The highest annual elected office, the chief executives of Rome, were the consuls. There were two of these each year. Their role as chief executives meant that they essentially inherited the political duties of the king, most important of these being leading Rome's armies. The consuls were also responsible for presiding over the Senate and the Assembly and for conducting elections for the following year's consuls and praetors. Holding consular elections was something a praetor could not do which meant that at least one consul had to be in Rome at the time of the elections. If that was not possible, if the consuls were tied up in war, or if one of them or both of them were ill or dead or whatever, if that was not possible and no consul was in Rome to hold the elections, the Senate could elect an interrex, a temporary official only holding office for five days, whose sole task was to oversee consular elections. The interrex was controversial because he was required to be a patrician. As a result, another alternative developed later on. More on that in a moment. The consuls did not govern together exactly. They were equal, but the two consuls took turns month by month 
presiding over the Senate and Assembly and handling the business of the city. In the battlefield, if they were leading an army together, they would alternate command day by day. Though it was increasingly common for Rome to be fighting two different wars or to have separate armies and separate campaigns, in which case the consuls would be commanding separate armies of their own. Nonetheless, each consul was equal and possessed the ability to veto an action by the other consul, just as was the case with all of the other colleges below them. This was called the collegial veto, the ability of any office holder to obstruct or cancel an action of his colleague in that office if it was dangerous to the Republic. So the consuls are doing all these kinds of things. I want to emphasize, though, that primary and overriding purpose of the consul was to lead Rome's armies. All other roles were secondary to this need. Widely respected ex-consuls might serve as the capstone to their career in the office of Kensor. There were two of these elected every five years, and their job was to conduct the census, detailing the membership, positions held, and wealth of all families above the minimum property requirement for military service, and count the rest, the head count. From this census, the armies were enrolled. Rome was going to war almost every year during the Republic for various reasons, and each time the Romans went to war, they would enroll a new army constructed from the list of eligible citizens as compiled during the most recent census. From this census also, the membership of the Senate was determined, based on the holding of certain priesthoods and offices with imperium. The censors also handled contracts for public works, like the building of roads and aqueducts. Two unelected positions reflected tenure at the top of the Roman system. Among the priests, the one with the longest tenure was the Pontifex Maximus, and this title was usually held for life. Unlike some other prestigious priesthoods like the Flamen Dialis, a Pontifex Maximus could also hold political office and would often be seen as consul or censor. The longest serving member of the Senate was the Princeps Senatus, or first senator and had the privilege of speaking first in any debate and thereby setting the tone and parameters for the ensuing discussion. There was one other elected position that was outside the ladder of offices, the Tribune of the Plebs, representing the needs of the plebeian citizens only. There were ten of these elected every year, and because the office was created as a check on the patrician-dominated offices like the consulship of the early republic, the tribunes of the plebs had special powers. First, the tribune of the plebs was sacrosanct, meaning that to assault him was a religious crime and punishable as an offense against the gods. Second, the tribune of the plebs possessed not only collegial veto, i.e. tribunes of the plebs could veto each other, but also a tribunitial veto, the ability to veto an action of the state that caused injustice to plebeian citizens. As you might imagine, this tribunitial veto is going to crop up as we see conflicts between the few and the many in Rome across the history of the Roman Republic. Finally, the Tribune of the Plebs facilitated the citizen's power of appeal. Any citizen unjustly treated by a consul or praetor or other magistrate could appeal to a Tribune of the Plebs, who would then take the citizen's case to the entire plebeian assembly for remission or clemency. One remaining office, unelected and unique, remains to be discussed. Whenever a dire crisis endangered Rome itself, whether from a foreign enemy or an internal threat, the Romans could create a dictator who had unfettered power and authority to resolve the crisis that had brought about his creation. Once that crisis was resolved, the dictator's reason for existing vanished, and his duty was thereupon to immediately resign, returning Rome to normalcy. A dictator's authority was strictly limited to the matter he was appointed to resolve. During the first 300 years of the Republic, up through the end of the war with Hannibal, the dictatorship was employed frequently, a total of 85 times. Each time, external circumstances caused the Senate or people to call on one of the consuls to name a dictator. 
After a solemn overnight vigil communing with the gods, the consul named that man who, through experience or character, was best suited to resolve that particular crisis. Usually this was an especially dangerous enemy or an internal insurrection, but dictators could also be appointed to conduct a special ritual to appease the gods in time of plague or to hold elections if it was impossible for either consul to return to Rome. The fundamental thing about the dictatorship, though, is that the Romans, uniquely in the ancient world, had this special mechanism to ensure that if the people that are currently in charge aren't the best ones to handle a particular crisis, you could invoke the dictatorship and put the best person to resolve this problem in charge, have him resolve it, and then return things back to the way things were before. After the war with Hannibal, the dictatorship fell out of use for 120 years until it was resurrected by Sulla and then by Caesar during the brutal civil wars at the very end of the Republic. So obviously, we'll talk about that later. A dictator was different from a consul in that his power was unrestricted and he was unanswerable for his actions. They were subject to neither appeal nor review by the tribunes or the people as long as they were directed toward the resolution of the crisis he had been created to resolve. This was signified visually by the fasces. A consul was preceded by 12 special attendants slash bodyguards called lictors. These lictors each carried fasces, three foot long bundles of rods, that signified the consul's ability to exert judgment on citizens. Outside the pomerium, these fasces were bound with axes in them, signifying that, as a general, he could order citizens to their death. But within the city, the consul's actions were subject to the right of appeal by the tribunes. Because this kind of review is incompatible with capital punishment, the consul's fasces did not have the axes bound into them within the pomerium, a visible sign that the consul's ability to act was circumscribed by the people's right of appeal through the tribunes. A dictator, however, was unanswerable and not subject to appeal. A dictator was preceded by 24 lictors, representing the fact that he had an imperium superior to the consuls, which is to say he could overrule an order of a consul. Their fasces were bound up with axes at all times. The Roman dictator, in theory, had unlimited power over the citizens. His imperium was not circumscribed by a right of appeal or a collegial veto or a tribunician veto or by anything other than his mandate the task that he was given, the crisis that he was required to resolve as dictator, and by the duty to resign as soon as that crisis was resolved. Fortunately, the Roman sense of honor was so great, and the precedent of restriction to mandate and immediate resignation on resolution of that mandate was so strongly reinforced, dictator after dictator, that no dictator before Julius Caesar at the very end of the Republic ever misused the office for his own empowerment, serving rather as a champion of all of Rome and a means of restoring the way things had been. In the next video, we'll talk about the assemblies of the Republic and how the Senate gave counsel and advice to the people and the consuls. For now, that's that.